Welcome to the VZB and our discussion about social science perspective on war. My name is Uta Almendinger. I'm the president of this institution, and I welcome you very, very much. The war against Ukraine has us all on edge. Every day we see horrifying photos and videos, scenes that we thought would never, ever happen on European soil. We are angry. We are worried. We are appalled. Throughout Europe, people try to help. We do too. Together with the Leibniz Association and our networks, we offer support for Ukrainian scholars at risk. And we must not forget the Russian researchers who are opposed to this war. We should keep up the dialogue with them as well. We want to understand the causes and consequences of this war. Scientific and intellectual analysis are needed, very much so. Today, we would like to offer first insights into how researchers at the VZB view the situation. You may also want to follow the new blog, which you find on our website. Now, in the first part, we will listen to very brief impulses from various disciplines at the VZB. The second part will be much more in-depth. It will be a panel discussion on core questions of the world order. I thank our directors and permanent research professors very much who are contributing to today's event. My particular thanks go to Jelena Kopak, research fellow at the Global Governance Research Unit, who will moderate this discussion. And I'm extremely, very extremely glad that Zana Muljokorotska is with us. Uh, and she is doing her PhD at Leibniz University, and she is also working as an assistant at the Institutions and Political Inequality Research Unit here at the VZB. Zana is originally from the Ukraine and has close ties with the Ukrainian community here in Berlin. She will give us some insights on the reactions in Berlin to the war. Thank you so very, very much, Zana, for being with us and giving the first impulse. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jana Milogorodska. Um, I come from Kyiv, a city which is being shelled every day by Russian army. I also belong to the Ukrainian community of Berlin. There were 24,000 of uh, Ukrainians living in Berlin, but during the last two weeks, more than 150,000 of Ukrainians came to Germany, and many of them stayed in German capital. After Russia attacked the whole Ukraine, 10 active uh, Ukrainian NGOs and citizens' initiatives came um, together and decided uh, to act together and communicate the voice of Ukrainian civil society. Among them is my NGO called Cinemova, Ukrainian Film Community Berlin, but also uh, Ukrainian school, Ukrainian scouts, Ukrainian church, Ukrainian radio, some cultural Ukrainian NGOs, and so-called virtual Ukrainian House of Berlin. There is still no a Ukrainian uh, cultural institute in Germany. We, we urgently need that. Uh, we work uh, together with the uh, Senate, Senate of uh, Berlin. 
which promises us uh, to find uh, a space uh, in Berlin for the Ukrainian community. Our alliance is uh, open to other Ukrainian organizations uh, which uh, support sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. Currently, our alliance is organizing a press conference which will take part uh, take place on uh, 20, uh, on this uh, Thursday, and where we will present our work. Um, yeah, members of our alliance, uh, raise funds, provide humanitarian help, support refugees, organize demonstrations, don't sleep. And it's hard for us to eat every day when the war is going on in Ukraine. We work in spheres of culture, education, media, and political communication. We meet with uh, German politicians and also write to them about the situation in Ukraine and our demands which are also expressed by other communities uh, of Ukrainians in other European countries. For instance, we demand more sanctions to, imposed, uh, to be imposed on Russia. We demand immediate comprehensive embargo on Russian oil and gas exports with the stop of Nord Stream 1 and after that no business as usual. We ask to stop supply of technologies from the world's leading brands to Russia. We ask to deliver air defense systems to Ukraine so the attacks from the air can be countered. We demand an increase uh, in supplies of arms and equipment, so this way Ukrainian defense capability will be strengthened. We ask for a no-fly zone over Ukraine so the Russian army will not be able to attack the civilian population from the air and critical infrastructures such as nuclear power plants. We ask to assist in the creation of humanitarian corridors. We ask for pedagogical stuff for Ukraine. Uh, we ask for um, easy access to the job market for refugees from Ukraine. Equal status for, of qualified pedagogical staff from Ukraine. More spaces at kindergartens additional classes at schools for Ukrainian children, more information in Ukrainian, and other necessary steps for better uh, integration of refugees. It is very symbolic that our office is temporarily based near Brandenburg at all, at Bilecki Institute, named after a Polish resistance leader, who reported about systematic murders systematic murders at the concentration camp Auschwitz during the Second World War. Yesterday, the representatives of our alliance of Ukrainian organizations had a working meeting in the space of the exhibition about genocides and Raphael Lemkin, who coined this term. What is happening now in Ukraine is not only a war. Russian army kills every day civilians. This is one of the reasons why my family can't leave Kiev, my hometown. This can be, if we will not stop this war, this can be called a genocide of Ukrainian people. The destruction of Ukraine is not the ultimate goal of Russia. Moldova, Baltic states, Poland, and other, uh, other countries could be next victims of Russian aggression. Russia already occupied part of Ukraine and started war in 2014. The response of the world to those crimes was weak, and it was a mistake. It is time to hear the voice of Ukraine and Ukrainian communities abroad, and at last stop Russian aggression with all possible means and stop being scared of nuclear uh, weapons uh, of the Third World War. Ukrainians have the right to defend their country. They will keep fighting for their freedom. 
and we will protect our free democratic Europe. Ukrainians of Berlin and the whole Germany are supporting and will continue to support our country as much as we can. Thank you for your attention. My name is Bernhard Wessels. I'm from the research unit Democracy and Democratization. After this speech, it is difficult to talk, I must say. My topic is democracy and war. Maybe I should better have titled it Transformation and War. And it is more or less probably not helpful. It is a helpless try to understand what is going on, why. There is a hypothesis of democratic peace. Simply stated, the democratic peace proposition claims that democratic states are less likely than non-democratic states to fight war against each other. So that started with Small and Singer, 1976, and literature is very rich. Uh, however, this claim has challenged by researchers like Henderson in his book, Democracy and War. It may be that we have to give up that hope, but it also may be that the hypothesis uh, of an opposite type is still valid. What is less contested in the literature is that transition makes a difference and maybe Russia in particular. Personalistic politics does not seem to be a new feature of Russia. Joseph Conrad, Polish-British novelist, wrote in his article on autocracy and war in the year 1905 about Russia. Russia is a country run by nothing but the arbitrary will of an obscure autocrat at the beginning and end of her organization. To understand Russia, one has to be inside the head the will of her leader. This seems to be true today too. At least it seems almost not understandable what is going on. However, there may be more systematic approaches to the phenomenon and to the explanation both of personalistic politics and affinity to military action. And this systematic approach can be seen in what Mansfield and Snyder wrote about incomplete democratization. They find that certain types of democratic transition markedly increase the risk of such dispute within diets. Particularly prone to violence are diets in which either state undergoes an incomplete democratic transition, that is, a shift from an autocratic to a partially democratic or anocratic regime that stalls prior to the establishment of consolidated democratic institutions. That was his <coughs> citation. Evidence suggests that states experience incomplete democratic transitions from autocracy to an anocracy and back are far more likely to become involved in military disputes and states experiences, <coughs> experience other types of regime change or no change at all. Still, that is not an explanation. That is describing a problem. What is behind the problem? Is it democracy knocking at the doors of autocracy? Let us have a look to the landscape of transformation. Comparing Freedom House, Starters of Nations, comparing the early period of transformation from 1991 to 1995, and the period 2016 to 2020 shows the following. Russia and Belarus changed <coughs> their uh, start us from partial free to not free. There is only one country of the former Eastern Bloc which also shows a negative change in status, that is Hungary, changing from free to partially free. And that's important. There are four countries having changed to the positive, from partial free to free. Estonia, Latvia, Slovakia and Romania. And there are, have been four countries with a constant status of being free which are Lithuania, Poland, Czech Republic, and Bulgaria. 
Ukraine is in between with being a stable, partial, free state. It seems that democracy gets too close. As the copyright journalist of Der Spiegel recently has put it, the desire for freedom and democracy makes the dictators afraid. The Russian war against Ukraine is also a consequence of this fear. Thank you. My name is Edgar Grande. I'm the founding director of the Center for Civil Society Research. And uh, I will, in my, uh, in my short uh, contribution, uh, focus on the relationship between external conflict and internal cohesion. Um, I, as a starting point, I will take uh, the functionalist theory of social conflict as uh, formulated in the 1950s by Louis Coser. Uh, and uh, uh, in his uh, book, he f uh, formulated the hypothesis that social systems that lack solidarity are more likely to disintegrate in the face of external threat, and the, and the war is certainly uh, a moment uh, of uh, external threat. And uh, he added that social systems that lack solidarity are more likely to disintegrate in the face of external threat. Why should this be relevant uh, for us? Um, uh, just uh, as a reminder, in recent years we had a debate on new divides and polarization in our uh, society, on the weakening of civil society, and on an increase of individualization and new singularities. So the Ukraine war uh, can be taken as a test for the strength of solidarity and civil society, not only in uh, uh, Ukraine uh, as um, uh, mentioned uh, by, uh, by Shana in her introductory statement, but also in our uh, society. And what are the results of su uh, such a test? I would like to share four observations uh, with you. First, uh, we observe a new solidarity move uh, movement uh, in Germany. There is a remarkable amount of spontaneous help for those directly affected uh, by war as evidenced, for example, by the willingness to provide private accommodation for refugees coming from Ukraine to Germany, or uh, for uh, the spontaneous uh, help for uh, civilian population in uh, Ukraine, or the willingness uh, to donate, um, um, and uh, as, uh, uh, as evidenced uh, by uh, uh, charity organizations, this willingness to donate has been higher in Germany these days than ever. Second, uh, we observe a new peace movement. Uh, uh, there have been large-scale mass demonstrations in a number of German cities since the outbreak uh, of the war. Uh, in my understanding, even more uh, remarkable are protest actions in a greater number of social spheres of activity, as for example in sports. Um, and third, um, the mobilization in the Ukraine war demonstrates the broad base of German civil society. It's not just the usual suspects uh, who mobilized and who have been active. Uh, it has included both older welfare organizations and new forms of mobilization from scratch. And finally and fourth, there is a remarkable unity among major political forces in German society. Apparently, uh, there has been no public uh, support for Russia among the major, the most relevant uh, political actors and societal actors. And there have been no controversies uh, among uh, major political parties or no visible divides within major political uh, parties uh, on uh, the German government's position uh, in war. And this is of particular importance uh, because uh, of the sharp U-turn of the new coalition in, um, new, uh, in foreign and defense policy, who has adopted a, a position which was uh, unthinkable uh, even a few weeks ago. Uh, so against this background, um, 
if I think it's fair to conclude that the societal responses to the war uh, in Germany are a remarkable and unexpected example for the large-scale mobilizing force and integrating power of German civil society. The open question, of course, is whether uh, this effect uh, is lasting. Thank you. Hello, I'm Yasmin Soisal. I'm professor of global sociology at uh, WCB. Uh, the broad view is that um, Putin invasion of Ukraine achieved unity and cohesion in the European Union. Surprising to many was the swift and decisive action the EU took in applying the temporary protection directive to those fleeing the war in Ukraine. Even the countries such as Poland and Hungary where refugees became a key reason in populist mobilization now support the opening of borders. Could this moment have a lasting effect on a common EU refugee policy in line with liberal values and commitments that the EU identifies with? While the current collective response strikes hope, there are reasons why we should be cautious about such an optimistic outcome. And I'll mention three relying on sociological wisdom. First point, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has been widely portrayed in the media, but also by the EU itself, EU leadership itself, as a war against Europe and what Europe stands for. While such portrayals feed into moral sense of worth, as sociology would uh, let us believe, and thus boost feelings of common belonging, identity, in the immediateness of an act of war, in the long run, it's not clear that these positions are sustainable. Consider this, just as Poland and Hungary opened their borders to refugees, the European Parliament voted to impose the long overdue sanctions on these two countries for undermining the EU's liberal democratic values. The sanctions may very well strengthen, strengthen the already existing populist sentiments in these countries and possibly in others, and might turn the public opinion against refugees. Second point, the temporary protection directive is clear. It applies to all persons fleeing Ukraine as a consequence of the war. Ukrainian nationals, but also third country nationals and stateless persons in Ukraine. The directive prioritizes the vulnerable status in the face of a war. It is the protection of the vulnerable that matters, not because of their national, cultural, or religious backgrounds. They need the protection because of their vulnerability. Yet, as pointed out by many observers, the cultural and civilizational overtones shade the media and political discourse on refugees. Such overtones serve as common empathy mobilizers for Ukrainian refugees, that's very good, but they also contribute to the dehumanizing of the other refugee. And ample sociological and experimental research shows that stigmatization, dehumanization, fuels support for anti-migration, anti-refugee political uh, policies, further delegitimizing the EU's self-narrative as the guarantor of liberal values. Third and last point, the vast majority of the world's refugees are regionally accommodated. Europe's opening its borders to war-affected people in a neighboring area is not an extraordinary act, and it's consistent with the reception in the region position that the EU has firmly taken in the last decade or so. The EU and individual member states are also among the major donors for refugee hosting across the world. The current refugee episode is a test for solidarity and unity, not only across Europe, but also for the global arrangements on refugee burden sharing. It's far from clear that Europe is ready for this test. Thank you.
Hello, <coughs> I'm uh, Ruud Koopmans, Director of the Migration and Integration Department here at uh, WZB. I want to, to address the horrible question, what if Russia wins, what if Putin wins? Some people think that Putin has lost already, that he has made a terrible mistake. I think he has made a terrible mistake in sort of underestimating the resistance of the Ukrainians, but that doesn't mean that his uh, possibility of his winning uh, is uh, not still the most likely outcome. And winning may be either occupying the whole of Ukraine, but it may, it may also be a favorable peace agreement, because all of the war objectives of Russia can in principle still be met. Recognition of Crimea, recognition of Donbas, the establishment of Novo Rossiya, connecting the Crimea to the Donbas, um, um, neutrality of Ukraine, uh, Ukraine um, promising not to become an EU member or a NATO member, anything in that direction, it doesn't even have to be the whole package, can be sold by uh, Putin and, and seen uh, by the outside world as a win for uh, Russia and for Putin. And in an interconnected and globalized world, such an outcome is not just the outcome of uh, a war between Russia and Ukraine. It is also the outcome of a battle of systems, of worldviews, one between authoritarian, nationalist, state-led capitalism, and at least the promise of liberal democracy. Putin has thrown down the gauntlet, and autocrats worldwide, in China, in Turkey, in Iran, and also many smaller potentates around the world, as well as populists within liberal democracies, are watching with hopeful curiosity. And Democrats and democracies worldwide are watching with fear and despair. If Putin wins in any way that is sellable as a win at home or to, and to autocrats abroad, it will be read as a signal of a defeat of the West, a defeat of liberal democracy. If the West or the alliance of liberal democracy cannot and will not even stop the killing of a people, of a budding democracy, directly at its doorstep, at the borders uh, of the NATO and of the European Union, how can any Democrat elsewhere still hope to receive any support when suppressed or attacked? And if the West or if liberal, the liberal democratic alliance is not willing and not able to stop Russia now, why would any autocrat elsewhere shy away from employing the same bullying tactics as Russia? That is why we need to support Ukraine to the maximum of our abilities. And that is not what we are currently doing. There's much more we could do. Uh, it has been mentioned in the introduction, but I, I do want to repeat what we are not doing still and what we could easily do. A full exclusion of Russian banks from SWIFT and not a SWIFT boycott, which actually excludes the most important banks used by the Russian state an oil, gas, and oil embargo, which certainly would have uh, negative consequences on uh, our lifestyle and the economy here, but that's what, you know, <laughs> that's what sacrificing something for democracy uh, means. Um, of course, more arms deliveries. Um, there's also much, much room uh, for more there, and even considering I'm not in, I don't, I don't think a full uh, no fly zone is a, is a feasible option, but one can, could certainly think about partial uh, steps in that direction. No fly zones in a zone uh, uh, around the NATO and the European Union borders, for instance, or in the Western Ukraine. You know, there's all these problems that are rightly posed that if you would want to establish a no-fly zone in the East, you would have to um, uh, basically di uh, disable um, uh, Russian air defenses. Well, there are no Russian air defenses in the Western Ukraine, so it would be possible. I'm, it's, I'm not a military specialist, but I'm sure more is possible there. At any rate, we must do more, and we must do it quickly to prevent uh, the outcome in which Putin would win. Because Ukraine's future is also the future of liberal democracy worldwide. And if there ever was a time for Nivida, never again, I think that time is now. Thank you. Part of our conversation by first saying thank you to Jutta Almendinger for her welcoming words. Thank you also, Jana, to you 
for introducing us to Ukrainian community here in Berlin and all the wonderful work you are uh, currently doing in helping um, arriving Ukrainians, unfortunately. Thank you also to our directors. They have really set us off uh, to a very good start uh, with their inputs. I can assure you that many of the topics that you have uh, just raised will also be discussed uh, here in this panel. I would also like to welcome our audience today, all of you who are present here in the room, but also those who are following us via live stream uh, on YouTube. My name is Jelena Tsupac. I'm a postdoctoral researcher here uh, at the VCB, and in the following hour, I will be moderating um, a more in-depth debate uh, on the war uh, in Ukraine. I would like to say that I'm very pleased that I was invited to moderate this uh, event uh, today, specifically because I deal with international security and more specifically with international security organizations such as NATO. But I'm also very, very sad that we are meeting here on this occasion because of this, uh, of this terrible and unprovoked uh, war. I sincerely hope that we as uh, social scientists will be able to shed some new light or some light on the causes and consequences of this war. And that being said, let me introduce to you our panel um, today. With us, we have Michael Thurn. He is a director of the research unit Global Governance here at the WCB and also professor of international relations at Freie University Berlin. Then we have Daniel Ziblatt, who is the director of the research unit Transformation of Democracy, also here at the WCB, and Eton Professor of the Science of Government at Harvard University. Lastly, but not least, we have Matthias Kum. He is a research professor of global constitutionalism, also here at the WCB, and professor of the rule of law in the age of globalization at Humboldt University, Berlin. I would like us to start this debate by taking a closer look at the causes, motives, and the reasons for the war in Ukraine, which are still somehow very hazy uh, to us. We can see that a debate has developed, that on the one hand we have those who are arguing that the West, and specifically NATO's expansion, NATO's eastward expansion, is to be blamed for what is happening in Ukraine now. But we also have those who say that we should open the black box of the Russian authoritarian regime and search for answers there. Uh, particularly Putin's concentration of power and his increasingly or increasing infatuation with ethno-nationalism, with certain militant and religious undertones. Mikhail, why don't you start, uh, start uh, with this as an IR scholar, and I know that you have some, some thoughts on this issue. Well, thank you. I mean, obviously there is this strong explanation which is by John Mearsheimer and neorealism with the expansion of NATO. And it is very strong because it was essentially announced before the war what will happen if there is this NATO threat to uh, uh, Putin. Nevertheless, I'm not really convinced by this uh, explanation. And uh, it has, I mean, Honestly, it has something to do with that I'm not very much convinced by the theory as such, but it has also something to do with the fact that I think the whole timing of this invasion is very hard to understand if you use this category of a response of Russia to NATO expansion. And essentially for three reasons, I would say the first reason is that the reaction of the West, which may be to some extent unexpected, but which for a good scenario planner would be part of a scenario, at least the worst case scenario or something like this in terms of the response of the West, uh, that this would have been much less likely under the former president of the United States. Uh, I mean, Joe Biden did a hilarious job in, in essentially putting the West together and also orchestrating it with uh, the responses by countries like Turkey and so on, and I'm quite sure that the uh, Biden administration stands behind it. And in that sense, I mean, we have this very strong response by the West, which would have been extremely unlikely uh, 
uh, given uh, President uh, Trump and his opinion about NATO, his opinion about European security, his opinion about Putin, and his opinion about isolationism uh, of, the, of, of the US. Uh, that's one reason, irrational in terms of timing. Uh, irrational also in terms of the original justification. I mean, yes, there is this offer, there has been a revived debate in 2018, but um, essentially with a result that at this moment in time there was no danger, I mean, I'm speaking, I'm taking now Putin perspective, no danger at all uh, of Ukraine moving uh, to NATO. Rather the opposite, uh, Zelensky has openly announced there will be no NATO membership with all likelihood within the next 10 years or something like this. So again, the timing is very, very hard to understand if you take this sort of NATO exp uh, expansion explanation seriously. And the third, of course, is that Yes, we heard already about it, um, and, and that probably leads to a sort of a positive explanation that there is something going on in this country, uh, uh, in Russia, um, not only, or in terms of both, in terms of a, a slow change of the ideological outlook from, let's say, 2004 to 2021, increasingly nationalist, increasingly authoritarian, increasing, increasingly ethnic, increasingly imperial. Um, and in that sense, uh, uh, there is a change uh, in, in the regime and a change also in the internal structure of the regime. I mean, obviously, the communication channels uh, are, have closed down a lot. And against this background, uh, there is a lot of things going on in Russia that we need to look at in order to understand what is uh, uh, going on. Just one remark to, 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 to Bernhard. In a sense, I mean, I can very understand very well that you look at, or that we should look at transitions, but in this case, it's not a democratic transition that has produced it. It's essentially the end days of an autocratic regime that sees that with the change of the uh, uh, energy policies in the West uh, in 15 or 20 years or something like this, Russia is anyway not uh, in, a, in a position uh, to, to compete seriously as a great power. And I think this outlook also plays a role in this kind of reaction. Yeah, Daniel Ziblatt, you might continue maybe answering to the same question, but I would also like to add something that uh, maybe is closer to your field of expertise. Uh, in his recent State of the Union speech, uh, Joe Biden has said that what we are looking at now is essentially the fight between democracies and uh, autocracies. Would you agree with this framing and how do you think it ties into the causes of this war? Yeah, I think this framing of uh, that the world is divided into autocracies and democracies is really a framing that was intended for domestic audiences. It's a, it's a strategy, it's a rhetorical strategy that he used during the campaign as well to rally people to the defense of democracy within the United States. You know, it may have some effects of, of rallying the, the you know, Western allies, Democratic allies, but I think it has an unintentionally negative effect of uniting China and Russia. And in fact, you know, the great strength of the West at this moment is potentially the division of these powers, and, and, a, and a vulnerability would be if these powers come together. And this is, there's been some rumors of this even happening in the last couple of days. So I think it's actually not useful as a kind of foreign policy stance to say the world's divided between autocracies and democracies, because there really is a big difference between China and uh, Russia. And in one particular way, a bit following up on Michael's point here, I mean, I think, I, I think of the causes of this attack as being what the causes of many wars is, is, is rooted in miscalculation and misperception. And in particular, Russia's uh, overestimation of its ground capacity, uh, the underestimation of the uh, Ukrainian resistance, and the underestimation of the Western potential response. So the question would be, well, why did, why did Putin make these mistakes? I think a large reason he made these mistakes, exactly the reasons that Michael just mentioned, which is that this is an authoritarian regime, and more than that, it's a personalistic authoritarian regime. And there's very good research showing that personalist authoritarian regimes, uh, work by Jessica Weeks at University of Wisconsin, personalist authoritarian regimes are much more likely to initiate wars than military regimes, single party regimes, let's say, like China. And, and it, it, it makes sense, right? I mean, you, if you're in a personalist regime where you essentially regard the, the leader regards the regime as their own private property, this is their own personal state, a kind of patrimonial regime, 
then you're much less likely to get good intelligence, uh, and you're much less constrained. And so I, I was on a, a panel a, a couple days ago, and one of the people at the panel said that, you know, this is a very simple thing. All we need to do is look at, you know, Putin wrote this essay, and he's just implementing his essay. Mm -hmm. And my reaction to this was, you know, I write essays, and I can't even get my students to read my essays. Uh, here you have an, uh, somebody who, after writing an essay, can implement this unconstrained, a single person. And this is, a, this is because it's a personalistic kind of regime, and so it's vulnerable to this kind of problem that we're seeing. Would you also be able to comment, uh, just to, to stay a little bit, on this issue of the timing, why Putin didn't invade during Trump's days uh, in office? And also, would we, I was also thinking about it, would it be easier for him or perhaps even harder because Trump seems like somebody who would like to play these games. So maybe he would be just a strong man on the other side. So what do you think? Yeah, Mikhail has a, a Spiegel article that, that begins with this, you know, what would have happened had this happened with Trump mm. in office. And it's really, it's one of these counterfactuals that we should be able to answer, but it's very difficult to answer. I, I guess my best stab at what would have happened would have been incredible passivity from the side of the United States. That Europe would have really been on its own in trying to mm. respond to this. Um, and so, you know, I, I, my sense is that, I mean, e even today, uh, pre uh, former President Trump hasn't actually condemned once what's just happened. He's, he's been given the opportunity multiple times. So I think in office, he also would have been very passive. And so mm -hmm. I think the situation would have been as is, but much more exaggerated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Matthias Kuhn, you can, of course, take some of the points uh, we have already had, but I would also have a specific question for you. We know that for many years, and especially after the Cold War, Russia and China have been kind of the most vocal defenders of the principle of sovereignty in international relations, a foremost principle of international law. Yet now we are seeing Russia violating this principle um, in a very, very flagrant way, seemingly without any justification. So could you maybe tell us a little bit more about that and maybe tie it somehow to the potential causes of this war? Yeah. And to begin with, I think uh, saying that currently Russia uh, is violating a principle of sovereignty is kind of euphemistically putting it. Right? They're engaged <laughs> in the use of force. Um, more specifically, they're engaged in a military invasion of another country that happens to be a liberal democracy. Um, and by doing so, uh, committing the crime of aggression uh, for which the International Court of uh, the ICC has jurisdiction to prosecute. Unfortunately, it would be difficult to get Putin there before that particular tribunal. But legally speaking, there is no question. This is a relatively simple case. It's not very controversial that a crime, uh, a crime of aggression has been uh, committed. So that up front. But now the question still is, um, why? What accounts, what accounts for this? kind of shift. And I think there are many layers, and I think uh, Daniel and, um, uh, and Michael have pointed to some that I don't disagree with, but I think to add to the picture, not to solely focus on, but to add to the picture, we have to also look at what Russia is looking at. And what Russia, Russia and Putin in particular, but this is part of Russian elite culture generally, mm -hmm. they're obsessed with the West. They're obsessed with the West. They focus on West, what the West does. And then they relate to that uh, in complicated ways. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things uh, that they have seen and they're deeply troubled by um, was violations of the uh, principle of non-interference uh, and, uh, uh, and sovereignty. Um, starting, of course, uh, with the Middle East. Uh, actually, starting, the story is a long one, which mm -hmm. starts already with the Clinton administration um, and the disintegration of Yugoslavia uh, and the bombing of Belgrade by NATO in the late 1990s. That's the first war uh, that happened after the Cold War. Um, and then, of course, the whole Middle Eastern uh, interventions uh, from starting from Afghanistan and Iraq, um, uh, Syria, Libya, all of them geared towards regime change, all with the ambition to create democracies, all of them failing dismally and creating carnage and death um, uh, while this is going on. Um, uh, so this is kind of um, the surprise uh, then is to some extent, and why on earth would Putin think about doing the same thing? Uh, in his, you know, it's a mirror image in many ways, he thinks of it uh, as a mirror image. Now I don't believe in this mirror image 
uh, from a normative point of view, I think there are salient normative differences. So I don't want to claim that the mirror idea, uh, the mirror idea is, I think, an idea that, that's, that's relevant for understanding Putin. I don't think it's an accurate analytical way of uh, thinking of what went on. But let's go on with this story. Uh, what happens next, just focusing on the Ukraine, we focus on, let's say, we can start with the various color revolutions in, uh, in the Ukraine mm -hmm. or in Georgia in the early 2000s, which took place with euphemistically formulated strong um, participation of international civil society, which inevitably will also be supported by and shot through with intelligence uh, activities. Um, uh, and that was something which in the context of the Maidan uh, later on in 2013, then was something that Putin got really upset about. So upset that he actually um, uh, put, or whether he did that or how it exactly worked, we don't know. But I, I don't know whether some of you have followed this, but at the time uh, there was a YouTube video available. So basically the Russians did what the Americans did through communications before the war, basically making available intelligence uh, information. And what they did, the, what the Russians did at the time, they made available on YouTube um, um, an audio um, of a conversation that they, um, they overheard between the Under Secretary of State um, in, the, in the State Department, mm -hmm. Victoria Newland at the time responsible for Ukraine, uh, and the ambassador uh, to Kiev, to, the, to Ukraine of the United States. And in this conversation, uh, which happened just after you know, there was some Maidan violence, and it was now a question of how the new government would be constituted. And the conversation between these two actors revealed very clearly that basically the actors in uh, calling the shots with regard to how the Ukrainian new government was to be constituted uh, were the United States. So this whole talk uh, of you know, not really being a democracy, uh, etc., is inspired by this kind of information and these types of facts. By the way, in the West, this video also became known. It went viral, of course. But very smartly, in some ways, uh, the, the passage that became viral was the one thing that she said, Victoria Newland said, excuse the language I'm just citing, uh, in one particular context dealing with procedural niceties of the European Union, she said, fuck the EU. Um, and then Angela Merkel responded, this is not how you talk to allies, etc. But the point is, that's a, that's a diversion. That wasn't the core issue. It wasn't how she dealt with the EU that was the core issue, the reason why this was made public. It was, it was the intervention, uh, the role that the United States played in this, in the backyard, as Russia would think of it. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So, and it is no surprise that right after this, right after this, after this, from the Russian description, and actually legally not false description either, coup, um, a, a popularly supported coup, popularly supported by approximately 50 to 60 percent of the population, uh, in Kiev, certainly in the major cities, but not in other parts of the country. Um, but as a result, so, and the new government, interim government, consists of a complicated coalition of actors, which does include, it's unfortunate, but it's true, it does include hard right. Svoboda people who basically would in Germany be certainly forbidden or at least under the observation of the Verfassungsschutz because they are hard right-wing nationalist Nazi-like uh, actors. So, and this is the side of the Russian story that's, that Putin always emphasizes. Now since then a lot has happened. There have been free and fair elections. Poroshenko uh, first after the interim government and of course Zelensky. All of those were free, open, fair elections. Um, and right now, um, um, there is no, no significant representation at all uh, of hard right-wing groups uh, in the Ukraine. So this whole talk of denazification and puppet uh, governments, etc., is obviously not correct. Um, but nonetheless, there is a story here, there is a historical connection, actual facts, um, mm -hmm. that this, his imagination is connected to. And so in this regard, now, speaking as a lawyer, uh, we must see that there were patterns of violations of the very norms that we endorse and, and propose and require other states to be held to that were systematically violated um, without any accountability um, uh, throughout uh, this whole period. And you can see 
how that creates resentment and a sense of humiliation. Uh, even if you don't believe the values of the other side, you know, the values that in which, the name of which this is done and the order is upheld is liberal democracy. Putinda couldn't care less about liberal democracy. But there is something very specific when you see you don't believe in the values of the other person, but you see the other side is not even taking them seriously, doesn't seem to be, is basically abusing them when, it's, when it suits them. Mm -hmm. That creates resentment uh, and humiliation. So I think if we want to understand uh, the dynamics here, um, uh, this is certainly a component we need to include uh, in the overall uh, understanding of the situation. Michal, is this something that you would like to react? Because this is the kind of argument that we hear a lot now in terms of kind of double morality coming from the, from the West. Let me, yes, and let me first say just one little word to this euphemism, uh, violation of sovereignty. Um, I think it's important to, to, to see that the term sovereignty has a double meaning. Uh, it has, in a sort of the world politics, a realism sense, meaning, and it has the meaning of democratic self-determination as a mechanism to allow a democratic self-determination uh, for a collectivity. Uh, when now the sort of NATO expansion realist people uh, uh, use the term sovereignty, they talk about the sovereignty of great powers systematically violating and mis disregarding the sovereignty of, of national people. So, I mean, we are talking about two different meanings mm -hmm. uh, of the term sovereignty, and one should be very careful uh, to, to not conflate this realist meaning with, with the sort of the democratic meaning um, uh, of uh, the term, and that happens to some extent, in my view, in the, in the public debate, because we should be all aware, I mean, if we would really say it is a, this sense of being not taken seriously and of losing and, and so on. Uh, the demand was to ignore the sovereignty principle for Ukraine because there is no allowance of the self-determination of this country if you accept that Ukraine cannot decide whether they want to be in NATO over or they want to be in the EU. I mean, that's just an addition. It's not at all in contradiction to you. I'm just saying we should be aware what it means to accept and to take into account these desires of uh, the Russian side. Uh, directly, I mean, I clearly would argue, uh, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I did so, that the major weakness of the sort of liberal international order that emerged after 1989 is... Uh, hypocritical elements, double standards, that alike cases are not treated alike. That clearly was a major weakness uh, of the kind of order that has dissolved in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, and it has created a lot of dissatisfaction uh, with this order and withdrawal from this sort of international institutions. But whether we can count it as a sort of a background cause for taking Ukraine, that's a sort of a, of, a, of, a, of a different question, where I would to some extent uh, question your argument. I mean, I see what you are saying in terms of the psychology, but this psychology only works if you have already a sort of a presupposition, there's a systemic competition between those guys outside of us and, and inside, and that already presupposes this sort of, if you may, autocratic versus uh, uh, versus democratic, but I would completely agree with you. It is not autocratic versus democratic. It's not the war of China against against democracy. It is the war of imperial power and a, a sort of a pre-modern uh, shape of the political regime that tries to survive in an environment in which there are successful autocratic regimes, economically successful autocratic regimes east of its uh, border and more or less successful democratic regimes uh, west of its border. Both stand for modernity and there is a system that stands, if you take from an IR perspective, the decolonization in the 1960s as the moment of, of, of modernity. You, this, it's a power which stands for pre-modern visions of the world order. Nevertheless, I mean, I agree that uh, this liberal uh, international order was 
to a significant extent hypocritical. And it's also true that I think, according to our calculations, no other statesman used the word hypo uh, hypocrisy or hypocritical about international institutions as often as Vladimir Putin did. So after almost three weeks of this conflict, I think it's starting to sink in that the world will not look the same uh, after this conflict uh, ends. So we will definitely have some kind of a new world uh, order. Some are saying that it's premature to make any kind kinds of pr predictions because we don't know when the, the war will stop, but importantly, we don't know where this war uh, will stop. Uh, others are a little bit more, shall we say, also enthusiastic, seeing this huge unity uh, in the West, especially in NATO and the EU. There is almost a sense that the liberal order is reviving in a way. So different prognoses are being made based on, uh, on this as well. I will also start uh, with you, Michael, um, just because you have an article out, I think in uh, Der Spiegel uh, on this question in particular. So what kind of international order can we expect or what kind of international order can we imagine after this war is over or even while the war is, uh, is transpiring? Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I, I think I should keep it short and then we should engage uh, in, in the debate here. I think Ruth has mentioned the decisive variable, essentially. Will Putin win or will uh, uh, Putin fall? Uh, if Putin wins, I'm not sure whether that would mit essentially mean that it has all those kind of negative effects. I mean, uh, Stalin won quite a lot after World War II. And because he won quite a lot, uh, he was considered as the enemy and essentially the reason why we got the EU that we have and why we got the NATO uh, that we have. So, I mean, a strong Putin will probably, in my view, create a sort of a clear divide within Europe between Russia and the rest of Europe, and that will or could at least lead to a revival of at least the European institutions or the Western institutions of the liberal order. If Putin fails, I would say, or if he falls, then there's the very optimistic version, and that means he falls uh, against the background of a democratization movement in Russia. Uh, that would probably really change uh, the uh, uh, international order because it would, would also put more pressure on China. Uh, uh, the alternative is essentially he, he fails and we don't see Putin anymore because of an of a even worse uh, Russian uh, nationalist government or because he essentially will be a puppet of, of China. So, I mean, in that sense, that are the sort of different uh, scenarios. When we start out with the question that Reed, uh, Ruth star, uh, started, will he win or will he fail, I'm just saying a slight difference here. When he wins, I think there will be a strong effect in terms of keeping up uh, the European un unity uh, in the way that we just uh, saw it in the last two or three weeks. I mean, I'm very much aware, and I'm fully with Yasmin here, that there will be many issues where we will see conflicts again. But I do think it will lead to a sort of, re of a revival of the EU. Daniel Zibla, the same question to you, but I would also like you to reflect a little bit on the state of populism in Europe now. So we, and also uh, in the United States, so we see all these populists kind of falling in line with non-populist uh, leaders. Is that just for a moment, do you think that they will revive, or is this a good moment maybe for uh, democracy? Yeah, I think it's undeniable there's been a kind of feeling of uh, an appreciation for our democracies in a way. In, in a way, I think what it does is it, at least to my eyes, I mean, this is my own perspective on it, it kind of highlights the childishness almost of some of the claims of tyranny of, you know, having to wear a mask, you know, compare that to the tyranny of having bombs fall on your home. I mean, this, the kind of populist complaints shrink mm -hmm. um, in comparison. So I think that has the effect of a dimin a defanging them to some degree. Mm -hmm. Um, that said, I, I do, th I mean, I, I've been in both in Europe and the United States in the last seven days, and so I have a little bit of a comparison I can make. I mean, I th my sense here is that just the, the, close, the physical closeness of this uh, means that the effect is greater here. Um, and uh, so I think the effect that you're describing might be, might be stronger here. Uh, I, I, whether it's enduring, I don't know. Um, I mean, I think in one way in which it has an impact is, that, and this is not even about populism, but just on politics in general, I mean, there's this sense in which Europe has for a long time 
been outsourcing its defense to the United States and outsourcing its energy to Russia. And there's sort of a recognition that both of these are, a pro, you know, I mean, I don't know, maybe defense is working out, but, that, but there's a vulnerability, right? And so mm -hmm. there's a way in which this will reshape politics, I think. Um, but I think in the U.S., the thing that it, it's really hard to assess, I mean, there, there certainly has been a bit of a rallying to Joe Biden, um, but, the, but given the physical distance, most Republicans are just remaining quiet. I mean, I think that there are some Republican, there's a kind of fracture in the Republican Party, continues to be as there mm -hmm. always has been, the kind of old, kind of Cold War wing of the Republican Party recognizes that Putin's a threat. But, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, Donald Trump hasn't vocally criticized Trump. Uh, essentially what I would call the entertainment wing of the Republican Party, which are all the, you know, Fox News and, and so on. They, you know, they are they're in some ways defending Trump and criticizing and repeating uh, Russian propaganda um, on their, on their uh, shows and podcasts and so on. And so that's still there. And I think that the challenge for the Republican Party is that... Uh, this kind of Cold War wing of the Republican Party can't win elections in November without that other wing of the party. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, they're, they're mostly staying quiet so far. And so, you know, I had sort of hoped that like me, uh, seeing this kind of shrinking of these complaints of wearing masks, that this would have a broader effect in, in American politics. But I'm, I'm quite nervous that that's actually the case. I mean, I really think that the Re Republican Party is focused on winning the election in November, the congressional elections in November. And at this moment, at least, they um, you know, are sort of just remaining quiet to see what happens. And if we think beyond uh, congressional elections and look at um, coming uh, presidential presidential elections in 2024 and the possibility of Trump coming to power. Do you think that the war will play an important role in, in these elections? It's, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, as a panel of social science, I don't want to make, you know, making predictions, yeah. but, I, but I think certainly, I think, you know, from my view, it seems as if this makes Trump look bizarre out there, kind of mm -hmm. praising Trump still, or pra praising uh, Putin and saying he's quite clever and all mm -hmm. of this kind of thing. And so I think at the end of the day, that probably hurts him. Um, but I'm not sure if it hurts his chances to win the nomination. I mean, I think it, he's, he plans to run, I think, and, you know, and there's still a reasonable possibility that he could win the nomination. So I think that that's still a, a genuine... So this doesn't take it off the table. Mm -hmm. let, let us see that. Uh, Matthias Kuhn, what is your sense of what kind of a new world order will emerge uh, from this? Do you think that the liberal international order, uh, with all its practices, will be revived? Or do you think that we can actually have something new, if we are talking constructively, if not everything just kind of descends into disorder. So will we see a new international architecture, both institutional and legal, um, arising from this war? When I say we, <coughs> again, I'm, I'm quite aware that we are in the domain of speculation yeah. uh, rather than prognosis. Yeah, and, and we are in the domain of speculation, but in the domain of speculation where the spectrum of possible outcomes are not circumscribed by the two core options that we've just discussed, which is Putin wins, Hood Kopman scenario, or on the other hand, as Senator uh, Graham um, uh, put it, S Senator of South Carolina in the United States, the Russians somehow lose Putin. So um, uh, these are two uh, scenarios, certainly, the second much preferred, uh, but there are other scenarios, and we have no idea what the dynamic of this is going to be. Um, and one of the uh, great difficulties uh, that the type of um, principled attitude, I would describe it that, strong and principled attitude that was, that underlay Ruth Koopman's presentation here. Um, I do think that putting Putin in this type of corner will make him escalate. Not because he thinks he can, uh, it, the way he thinks about it, I, and this is speculation, but I think we have no reason to believe, knowing everything that we know about him, that when you put someone like him in a corner, don't give him an off-ramp. You give him no way to, to save face. What's he going to do? Really? He will step down and, tr and withdraw somewhere? Um, uh, and, you know, that's not going to happen. Uh, so, yes, maybe he will be killed uh, in the Kreml by someone uh, in the Russian elites. That's a hope to have for, for some. Um, but in the meantime, uh, what, what his inclination will be is to escalate. And the core idea here is when you have nuclear weapons, the question of their usage is a question of will. It's not about technological superiority. Um, and about it. The question is, how much does this matter to you? To me, it matters a great deal. 
And it matters so much that I will, and this would be the next step, break the taboo to make use at least of tactical nuclear weapons and explode one. Where he'll explode it, what the casualties will be, probably want to reduce them to a minimum, but that's going to be the, that would be the next mm -hmm. escalatory step. And then the question is going back, so what are you going to do about that? Do you want to meet that? And if you do, I will escalate further. How much does this mean to you? Do you have a reason for it to mean as much as it does to me? That's the game. Um, and I don't want to know what the outcome of that type of game is and what the various calculations are going to be by uh, Western actors responding to that. So there's a real serious cause for concern. And I think we should be very, very careful um, uh, by those who propose the toughening measures, being tough, etc. I understand that. I think there, is a, there's a, there are good grounds. There, what motivates this type of an attitude is the right one. But at the same time, think strategically and be aware of who you're dealing with and what, and, and what the complications and the dynamics might be. And in this kind of consolation, to gain time, to slow down the dynamics, may be as good as you can hope for, even if it means, and it's terrible to think about this, even if it means that the war goes on um, and, and people get killed and fighting goes on, etc. But so it's a terrible situation. We should see it as it is. It's a terrible situation with, an, with, a, with a potential mm -hmm. for a dynamics which goes way beyond what we are currently see. Okay, now to the question. Um, I don't want to speculate what the after is because that really depends on how things go. But I do find it interesting right now. Uh, there's a certain way of thinking about the present, about the present, uh, which is all about sight and vendor. We have to wake up. We were in a dream. And now we have to wake up. And the question is, in the different analyses that are out there, what is it that we're waking up from? And what is the reality that we are supposed to face? And there are different ideas animating that. Um, the first idea is kind of the realist idea. Uh, John Merzheimer, etc. Um, it's an idea which basically... Uh, they all have in common, by the way. They all start off with the, cliche, with the Fukuyama cliché, uh, we imagined a world of liberal democracies which would develop, um, um, which would spread over time. There are no major powers which are ideologically fundamentally opposed. Um, um, uh, and you might go on, and I always said that actually even post-September 11, that's basically true, because that was not a real challenge, that was a luxury uh, to make such a big deal out of it. Um, I think that's historically how people will judge the post-September 11. Uh, era to a large extent. It was an overreaction. Um, uh, Chinese look at it that way, and I think they get this one right. Um, uh, but so, um, so here the claim is um, 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 that um, we need to. Um, uh, sorry, I've, I've now lost this this particular this particular uh, point. It's <laughs> it was, terrible. It was so brilliant. Can somebody jump in? <laughs> so, uh, no, 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 let, me, let, me, let me continue <laughs> the three ideas, the three yeah. core ideas. They're all mm -hmm. about Fukuyama's wrong, mm -hmm. uh, but now the question is what exactly was wrong? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, according to one conception, this is, the, this is the clash of civilizations idea, the realist idea. Um, what was wrong is the idea that there is a, a, a genuine global appeal for liberal democratic principles. This is a result of Western hegemony, and now it's just the time of you know, recognition that there, is, there are actually other civilizations, other powers that are grouped around major powers, great powers, and it's about showing respect, about managing the boundaries and about managing conflict. That's what international law should do. It's going to be divided up into different mm -hmm. spheres of influence. So this is one kind of model, a combination of Huntington and Carl Schmitt's idea of, in his 1939 uh, essay, um, uh, völkerrechtliche Großraumordnung mit Interventionsverbot für raumfremde Mächte. So large spaces, regional spaces, with a prohibition of foreign powers entering into it, and the assumption that internally you can enter into the neighboring states in the um, etc. So that's that's an alternative idea. I think that's a terrible idea, <laughs> and it would be uh, a sad thing if the if the international community, if the global community, evolved into. Uh, that type of uh, new world. The second scenario is the idea that liberal democracies, the world of liberal democracies has to have to kind of toughen up. We were too soft for too long. So the idea, for example, of not responding strongly uh, after Russia 
um, uh, invaded Crimea and initiated the con and con mm -hmm. uh, conflicts in the Donbass. Basically get away with it to a large extent. I mean, there were sanctions imposed, but it was relatively weak. And the fact that China was constructively engaged, the idea that we should kind of help them become richer because this is the Fukuyama idea. Over time, when they get richer, they'll turn to liberal democracy. So there's no enemy that we are... F so you know, so the, that's naive. That's the second view. Mm -hmm. That's naive. And we've got to kind of harden up, um, uh, understand also that we need to defend ourselves more, spend more in the military. This is not just Germany, but Europe more generally. Uh, and perhaps more generally embrace a more... Uh, an outlook in which military force will have to play a more significant role. So the idea is here, si vis pacem parabellum. So if you want peace, you've got to prepare for war. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's kind of this, the second model that is out there. Um, uh, I do, I'm very skeptical. Uh, I'm not particularly enthusiastic about that one either. And then there's a third one, which is less present, but it ought to be more present in my view, um, which, is, um, which is an idea that, you know, what Gandhi once said about what he thought of Western civilization, he thought it would be a good idea. <laughs> um, uh, and you, know, you can say that about the international liberal order. Uh, you say, what do you think about the future of the international liberal order? You can say, it would be a good idea. And what I mean by that is, is there are certain basic structural features hardwired into the way the law currently works. This isn't the question of one actor being a bad apple or some other. This is about how currently law is structured, that basically um, uh, secures, uh, uh, enables unaccountability by major powers. Um, uh, great powers can get away uh, with systematic and regular violations of international law, can't plausibly be held accountable. Um, and, that's, and, and there's no reason why it should be like that. And of course, th so we'd have to talk about the jurisdiction of the ICE International Criminal Court, compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice, these types of legalistic sounding, mm -hmm. but fundamental structural uh, ideas relating to international uh, legal order. And we also have to talk about something else. I mean, why aren't we really deeply upset, really deeply upset and appalled by the idea that it's possible for one actor, you know, Putin at this point, but we were worried about Trump a little bit some years back, um, basically having control of nuclear weapons which can destroy the world. Do we want to live in a world where our existence and our way of life depends on certain individual actors in certain, sometimes far away, sometimes near, uh, countries either not going not drifting off into some kind of problematic psychological state, which is always a possibility and has historically occurred often enough. If you're in the Kremlin for more than 20 years, very few people remain sane um, uh, after that amount of time uh, in that type of position. Um, and secondly, even if there is no mental health issue and if psychologically you're well balanced, strategic miscalculations and accidents that can easily occur in certain kind of competitive environments. No, so, no, is this the kind of world? Uh, uh, is that an international, is that a liberal legal order? But, but Matthias, you are, I mean, your first two scenarios, I can see, how shall I put it, empirical dynamics that could lead into this direction. What kind of empirical dynamic as an outcome of this war could lead to a situation that the world says, well, we get rid of nuclear weapons, in spite of the fact that 10 or 15 countries can build nuclear weapons overnight and can threaten the rest of the world who, is, who has not any more nuclear weapons uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a way like Putin does now with the rest of the world. I mean, I think this is normatively desirable, what you say, but I think I don't see any dynamic as an outcome of this war that goes into this direction. I mean, I, mean I, would, I would argue, yes, if we think in terms of the best possible outcome, the best possible outcome is Putin falls because of a democratization movement in, 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 in Russia. Then we will see a certain move towards a revival of the post-1989 liberal international order. And perhaps, but this yeah. liberal international order will be one with nuclear weapons. And perhaps, Daniel, you can jump in uh, here with uh, telling us a little bit about the dynamics of authoritarian regime and yeah. whether this scenario of uh, Russia uh, democratizing is a real one. 
Yeah, I mean, this may is be a, this may be as not quite as fanciful, but you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. potentially. I mean, so it's, but it's, no, it's the yeah, best possible right. outcome. But I do, but I do think, I mean, one solution to this issue. But is, is it possible? That would right. also be my right. right. Although right. desirable, whether it is actually possible given the dynamics of the regime. But I think it's also a solution to this. I mean, it is a solution to uh, not a, you know partial solution to the situation you're describing. The idea of the, of one individual being able to decide everything. I mean, that's the nature of democratic constraints, one might yes. imagine. I mean, you have a national security state, which means power is concentrated in the hands of the executive, but one would imagine in a democratic state there's greater constraints built into this. So, But, yeah, so, I, I mean, certainly this is a nice nice potential solution, but I, I, you know, I think authoritarian regimes are pretty robust. Repressive authoritarian regimes are even more robust. Regimes with oil are even more robust. I mean, if, if we, you know, think how long people have been waiting for the Venezuelan regime to collapse. I think in some ways Venezuela and Russia are, are analogous in certain ways. Uh, Russia even has a bigger repressive apparatus. And so I think there's a lot of it, you know, so if you have a lot of oil money, you can buy, if you can buy off enough key constituencies uh, and you can kind of coup proof yourself as an authoritarian, le personalistic leader, it's, it's, you know, one can stay in power. It's hard to remove these guys from power. So, you know, not, not to say that this would not be, uh, you know, an outcome that one would applaud, but it's just, I, I think, as from the perspective of, you know, the moment that we're in, we, I don't think we can rely upon this mm -hmm. as the solution that we're waiting for. I mean, that we need to deal with the reality that yeah. we're in and to try to, to try to constrain and limit the damage. Matthias uh, think, would like to jump yeah. in, but I, I would ask you just a little bit shorter because we have one more topic to cover. There's a, there's a Gary Larson cartoon um, where you have a scientist uh, kind of scribbling on, the, on, a, on a tableau, you know, lots of complicated formulas and super derivative, you know, very, very sophisticated. And he points to a particular point in this complicated equation. He says, and here, in this crucial point, a miracle occurs. <laughs> yeah, right. um, and in some ways, it's true. Um, uh, when we think about, you know, Putin losing power, or when we're thinking the, about the abolition of nuclear weapons, I would put them roughly on the same plane at the moment. Mm. Um, uh, they're both highly unlikely. Um, but I think when we, t when we think about order, um, one of the things that this kind of conflict should, have, should teach us is that things that we have thought were unimaginable and no longer part of our world and not really, you know, just not really thinkable are actually possible and thinkable. And so this is a time where a certain kind of creative imagination to move beyond um, should, should be entertained. And, and it's not that utopian. Now, we are very proud that 141 countries have condemned Russia. Um, uh, and so it's a qualified majority of states, significant um, with regard to the invasion of the Ukraine. It's also the case that 122 states uh, have voted uh, for the abolition of nuclear weapons. It's just that not a single NATO country was among them. Hmm. So, there are certain biases here in this room, uh, perhaps, if we think of this as crazily utopian. It's certainly not deemed to be within the kind of respectable kind of issues if you're in the security establishment. Mat of Matthias, it's, 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 it's not an argument about what I would consider as good or as bad. And what I, I understand that. It is, it is an argument that I just see it as absolutely impossible that as a sort of a effect of this war when a crazy guy essentially threatens the world with nuclear weapons that in this kind of situation the world and the US and all the other uh, nuclear powers say well we now give up our nuclear weapons so that the next crazy guy can really use it uh, one I sentence mean, I mean, that's, one, that's, one I'm just saying that's extremely unlikely mm -hmm. and 10 to 20 times as unlikely as a democratization movement in Russia uh, one uh, sentence uh, getting rid one of sentence Putin. response one um, sentence. Do you think that if a nuclear weapon is used by that crazy man, it might be different? I'll have to think about it. Maybe, maybe the movement will be stronger, but the counter movement will be stronger as well. But because it would mean without nuclear weapons by others, it would mean the complete uh, uh, succumption of the rest of the world to this guy with the nuclear weapon. My but question ties in. Uh, Daniel, do you want to add something? Well, I was just going to say there is an option between abolishing nuclear yes. weapons and a nuclear war. Um, you know, and Rude, in fact, mentioned some of these. I mean, you know, so uh, German European reliance on gas and, and Russian oil. I mean, take away some of the structural. And these are things that are, are going to be themselves already difficult 
but are real measures that could be taken. Indeed. Indeed. So I think and, and, you know, that's on the agenda, but I think it's worth repeating it just because I think it is so crucial. I think my question ties nicely, my next question, into this uh, small debate that we are having, and it will go first to you, Mikhail. So what do you think the exit strategy is now? Um, everybody is quoting this Santu saying, build your opponent a golden bridge to retreat across. I have seen it uh, so much. Um, what is it? So we, are, we don't know what Putin exactly wants with this war, but what does the West want uh, with this war? Uh, do we want just Ukraine to win the war? Do we want Putin to fall? And do you think that there is a danger that the West will eventually end up in talks about spheres of influence with, with Russia, which is essentially what Putin would probably love at this moment? What needs to be done? I mean... On, on this direction that, that Daniel started, thinking about ways in between, and ways in between the Munich dilemma that Matthias uh, 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 sketched in response to Ruth, uh, Ruth playing the Churchill role and, and Matthias playing the, the, the Chamberlain role. I mean, in, in this specific case, I probably would think there's, regarding the uh, arms uh, export possibility, there is still room. And even in the logic of the dilemma that you describe, since there are more or less established rules, what kind of weapons you can export to a war-fighting countries from the East-West conflict in the so-called... And shelter. there the hope would be that Ukrainians win this war. That would no, be the no, main I mean, I'm goal. Just, of I'm just saying, if we think now, how can we weaken Putin? How can we strengthen Ukraine? That would be essentially, uh, I think, then the, the whole issue of delivering uh, weapons is one where one can think further, given the existing rules of the old East West conflict. And I'm saying this because it is a very personalistic regime, there's no question. But when it comes to the use of nuclear weapons, the generals of, of uh, Russia will play a role, and they are socialized in the East-West conflict. So in that sense, uh, we, we can essentially go that far as uh, people went during the East-West conflict. That would be one way to, to go uh, out of this d dilemma that the two of you uh, essentially have, have, have talked about. I would say, secondly, yes, um, if we can do anything, we need to help to prepare a sort of a, of a temporary uh, solution, which uh, probably would include a sort of a federal structure in Ukraine with increased self-determination rights for uh, the people uh, in, in eastern Ukraine. It would probably include a sort of a one-sided uh, declaration of Ukraine by Zelensky that they do not plan to enter into the NATO in 15 years uh, and, and things like that. I mean, that's something that we could help to prepare, but in my opinion, this becomes only very likely if Putin sees that he cannot win the war. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, 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 I don't see the, the opportunity in this kind uh, of situation. And the third thing that, that I would think in terms of what, what to do is indeed taking historical uh, uh, opportunities. The window of opportunity that that uh, Matthias was thinking big when he was thinking about nuclear weapons and thinking small is, isn't this the moment for building up a European defense capacity and one that is not directed against the NATO. Uh, it is a second pillar uh, of the NATO and it is at the same time a safety net if that happens what uh, Daniel was talking about that the Republican candidate is Donald Trump and if there is a candidate of the Republican Party and even if he starts with, uh, uh, with, with being behind 10 or 15 percent many things can happen right and uh, I mean if he in a permanent conflict with a regime that is dominated by Putin on the one hand and if we have an American president uh, call Trump or something like this, then we need to prepare and we need to build up a sort of a, um, of a European defense capability. And I can only imagine that this happens in some form of close cooperation, but of course with very clear decision-making units that there is a possibility to decide. And I think if there is an opportunity, there is now a historical opportunity. 100 billion uh, of Germany, Macron as president of France, thinking about a strong uh, uh, Europe and 
sorry to add, um, UK not anymore in the game. Daniel, would this be your hunch as well? Because you have talked about the dependency, security dependency of Europe on the US and energy dependency on Russia. Do you think that this is the moment for creating these kinds of uh, independent security and energy? Spaces? Yeah, I, well, certainly energy, um, I, you know, and this is linked with climate change and responses to climate change. And, and I, you know, my hope would be that the US and Europe would continue to be cooperative and they, this would not be, a, I mean, I think it, in the way that Mike, Michael described it, this is not a competitive structure, but it's, in fact, complementary um, uh, with with NATO. Um, and so I, I, I agree with that. One thing I would say, I mean, there was a way in which the site and vendor discussion, I mean, this is almost like a word of warning. I mean, the, the, there was a kind of moment of exhilaration in that we have aban we've awoken from our slumber and we are, you know, we're now stepping up to this res historic responsibility, which I, which I think may, may be right. But I think it's also a somber moment because, you know, I, I, when, when, once one has capabilities, I mean, I think this is what the American experience teaches us, is that it's, one faces dilemmas, and one gets charged of being a hypocrite because one intervenes in some places and not in others. One intervenes mistakenly in some places and not in others. And with this kind of a military capacity and military expenditures come a whole new set of ch uh, political right. choices and, const and constraints and responsibilities that, that, are, that are very, very difficult. And so, you know, just the point is, like, that's, we need to mm -hmm. be aware of that. So that's something that Germany is going to now face. Have you note an American asked us to stay below 2%? <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, so, you know, and I think it's, I think, it, you know, I'm not saying that it's not necessary. I'm not saying that it's you know, ultimately a good thing. But I think it's just that we should be aware of that. I mean, number one. Number two, you know, the, the national, the, the kind of idea that Eisenhower warned of, of a, of a kind of, the corrupting influence of a, of a security apparatus on a democracy is also a very real thing. And the concentration of when you have uh, increased military expenditures, you're going to have an increasingly secretive executive. And so one just needs to, again, it may be necessary, you know, embrace it. But on the other hand, recognize that there are certain threats and risks mm -hmm. to democracy to come with that. And so, you know, this, so in, that, in that sense, I think this, the Seitenwende is a, is a somber moment. I mean, it's not a moment to celebrate. It's a somber moment where world events have developed in such a way that this is now necessary. So I guess that would, that's one point I would add. We don't have much time uh, until the end of this session. We have opened many interesting uh, questions. We have not been able to go very deep because we only have one hour. But I have one last question uh, that relates to the role of intellectuals at this uh, very moment. It is a question that I was also asking myself, whether now, because even in this conversation, we've seen that inevitably we have to be normative uh, in some way. So would you be able to, to tell us how do you see the role of European uh, and uh, US, maybe we should preface it in that way, uh, intellectuals in this very difficult moment when we are again thinking about a nuclear war, when we have so many refugees, so many of the very scary scenarios are happening in our uh, heads and many moral issues are being raised. So Matthias, maybe we can start with you. Yeah. Well, I think the um, core responsibility for somebody who thinks about uh, law in the widest sense, contextualized, politically, philosophically informed, that's what we do at, at, at my research group. Um, it is to contextualize um, uh, what is going. There's a tendency, if something, and particularly when something is terrible, as this is happening. It's all the focus on Putin, Russia, Mm -hmm. And then we have images of what's going on in the Ukraine, terrible situations of some uh, family dying on a bridge, residential buildings being bombed, you know, all of these kinds of awful uh, images. And then, there's, uh, and then there are refugees, and then there's people... So there's, there's a lot of... We're overwhelmed um, by context, by this specific situation. And, then, and yet we have to act. There are decisions that need to be made now and today, and there's a public discourse going on about it. And I think our role, um, or one of our roles, I'm sure there's more than one, uh, might be to contextualize this, to bring in the wider, a wider perspective, both historically, comparatively, normatively, reflect mm -hmm. on the normative stakes. You know, many of these dramas and tensions are well, the ones that have been thought about in different contexts, and see, you know, what can we learn from that? So what, what are the contributions? And, and concretely, just to bring it back on one point, the tendency right now, for example, to say, um, you know, we got a 
cut all ties, uh, etc., uh, become independent of oil and gas, etc. I understand that. And right now, there are huge amounts of money flowing to Russia from Germany, which are being used for the war effort. That's unbearable when you think about it. Unbearable. But at the same time, uh, it was, I think, FDR, the architect of the new liberal world order after, post -war, after World War II, which after the Cold War kind of further grew, he believed uh, that it was fundamental uh, for an order to um, be able to be peaceful over time, that it be in the, in interdependent, uh, that the major actors, the major powers, would be economically integrated and interdependent. And so the great, which we're seeing right now, the great disentanglement uh, between the United States and China, which are economically very strongly entangled previously, is, is bad news. And the idea of, of the rest of Europe uh, becoming completely disentangled uh, from Russia is also, I think, um, uh, uh, as, as important as it might be in the short term, mm -hmm. something not to strive for uh, in the mid to long term. Um, so that's one of the lessons of historical thinking and normatively informed mm -hmm. uh, thinking that I think we can uh, draw from this. Now back to the Chamberlain versus, uh, that's another historical okay. lesson, right? Chamberlain versus Churchill. Um, I'm not taking a position on what to do here. Uh, this is a very complex judgment that I'm very happy I'm not in the position to take mm. because the trade-offs are so, it's so complex, you need so much detailed information and, it's, and there are terrible risks you're incurring either way. So these are just really hard questions, whoever makes, whoever makes those uh, decisions. There are stupid ones you can take, but the ones that we've been discussing are within the range of, of potentially good ones. I don't know which one is the, one is the right one. I think very few people um, uh, do. But we have to understand that the choice between Churchill and Chamberlain uh, may be somewhat different when we're in a nuclear world uh, than in the pre-war world, pre-World War II world. Daniel? I'll be very brief. I mean, I, I agree with a lot of this. I mean, I th one thing I'm struck by is the degree to which people's assertions about what's supposed to happen or what should be done are always premised on hypotheses about how people will act. So, you know, if we do this, then Putin will do this. If we don't do this, Putin will do that. And these are always hypotheses, and there's incredible amounts of uncertainty about them. And so that's, so I think bringing the mind of a, the, or, the kind of orientation of a social scientist and realizing that these are hypotheses and maybe we could draw upon evidence to kind of, you know, think about the plausibility of some of the hypotheses. And, I, and unfortunately, I think the promise of social science isn't that we'll mm -hmm. say, okay, well, that we'll know if we do this, this will happen. It's just to kind of maybe reduce a little bit of the uncertainty. So mm -hmm. that, that's a very modest but an important goal. I think a second thing that social science does is to, to use the right categories and concepts to, to code what's happening. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if we say that, you know, as you sometimes hear, I mean, this, there's, this is a really extreme example, but you'll sometimes hear American congressmen saying, you know, Putin's a communist, you know, you know not quite using the right authoritarian label to describe what this mm -hmm. kind of regime is. So having, you know, concepts like personalism or patrimonialism to diagnose what's the, how does the regime operate I think the concepts help, if they're, if they're accurate concepts, can help guide us in we, how we think and about the problem. And try to translate this to wider uh, public or just... Well, no, I th I, I'm, th I'm thinking of policymakers as they think yeah. about this, as they kind of model out, let's say, the relationship of, of Putin and his generals. I think it, that the, the model is premised on a concept of how the regime operates. It's not, mm -hmm. purely, it's not a kind of purely descriptive thing. I mean, we mm -hmm. always have concepts, and so the, the, the point is to be self-conscious about the concepts and hope that the concepts we're using are the ones that are directing our attention to the right kinds of variables and factors. Michal? We yeah, are nothing, nothing to add. I mean, I agree with, with what has been said. I would say as uh, social science, the only thing what we can do is pointing to conceivable causal mechanisms that produce effects. That is something completely different than predicting uh, these, these effects. It's rather uh, what kind of causal mechanisms could be and will be probably triggered uh, in different situations, but the outcome is still something completely different. And, and that's something where social scientists should be willing to make those kind of dangerous uh, assessments and help society to do it. 
uh, but also uh, creating a sort of an awareness how many risks and uncertainties are involved in all of those decisions. As intellectuals, I think in this kind of situation, when we are talking about extremely complicated moral issues with dilemmas, uh, uh, then it is the major task to provide a sort of a moral compass, compass as we would say uh, uh, in German. In that sense, maybe social scientists and, and intellectuals have two different tasks here. Hmm. Uh, and as Matthias did, pointing out the sort of dilemmas without necessarily mm -hmm. solving them. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much uh, to all of you. Thank you very much also to our uh, previous speakers. I hope that all of you enjoyed this discussion very much, that there was um, a lot of questions uh, answered, but also many questions have been opened and uh, not answered. Uh, my hope is that we will meet uh, again here, but that next time we will actually be talking about peace rather than uh, war. And on that note, I would like uh, to end this. Thank you. Thank you.